We'll be kicking off our discussion segment now by focusing on who and who are doing what uh, to fashion out a way of arresting the potential spread of coronavirus in Nigeria. And right now, we're joining Arise Abuja studio to discuss this subject with Professor Mujisola Adeyeye, Director General of the National Agency for Food, Drug Administration and Control, together with Dr. Clement Peter, World Health Organization's country representative in Nigeria. Good morning, Prof. Good morning, uh, Dr. Peter. You are both welcome to the morning show. Good morning. Welcome to the program. Good morning. Are you with us? Yes. Yeah. I can see you uh, on the screen. Well, but let me start with uh, Dr. Clement Peter, who is a country representative of the World Health Organization. And I would like to ask you, Dr. Peter, what's your assessment of Nigeria's response uh, to the uh, threat of coronavirus and how Nigeria has handled the case so far, both in terms of infrastructure and information, public enlightenment? Thank you, moderator. Um, I'm happy to say that uh, Nigeria, before receiving this case, had put in place some element of uh, preparedness. There was capacity already to confirm and this capacity also to isolate, and that the Nigerian people were informed. This case was identified promptly, a high index of suspicion, which is very important and critical to see that uh, the health workers are well informed and are able to protect themselves. As of now, the case is doing well. The, the optimism that uh, he will get out of it, and that the government is doing every effort to ensure that uh, the Nigerian people are kept uh, safe. One, the number of lab capacity has increased. Um, three weeks ago, we were talking of two lab capacity, but now we are talking of four or five. This is great. Secondly, the government is taking the response seriously at the highest level of the government to ensure that Nigerians are well, well informed uh, to remain safe. That the capacity to treat has also scaled up. A lot of supplies are coming to the country to ensure that uh, the country is able to uh, respond quickly. So this is uh, quite uh, uh, encouraging to the nation and ensuring that uh, response to any public health threat is not only the government. All of us are part of this journey. As a community, we must know what this disease is, how do we prevent ourselves. We must also uh, support ourselves and the government to ensure that if anyone is sick, you report immediately for the government to be able to assist right from the community, uh, from the communities where we stay, but also those who enter the country may not be detected. So it is in this situation, it's a global solidarity. We need ourselves as one. We need to act quickly in terms of preventive measures, which are cheap and important. And should anyone get infected, uh, he or she gets treatment quickly. So the principles and the strategies are very clear. We have to minimize human-to-human -human transmission. We need to identify cases as early as possible and treat them. And we need to slow down the spread should it happen. Thank you very much for that, Dr. Pieces. You're certainly right. This is a collective effort that it takes, and Nigeria should certainly be proud of our efforts so far by the agencies to ensure that we're not in a position where we've had that much of an outbreak. And Professor Adeye, I'd like to come to you and also get your take on that, and Nigeria's preparedness and also response to uh, the coronavirus so far. We've only had one confirmed case, and this is 10 days on now. We still haven't had another confirmed case yet. Yet. Should we be hopeful? Can, can we be happy yet? What is your take on that, especially considering the fact that we woke up this morning to the news that Senegal has now confirmed their third and fourth cases? Do you think we have strong enough public health policies across ECOWAS to ensure that this doesn't put us at even more risk, seeing as our efforts to contain the virus so far have been very, very commendable? Thank you so much uh, for having me. 
I believe that Nigeria is uh, well prepared uh, from what Dr. Clement just said. Uh, there was increase uh, in capacity, uh, f I believe, from two weeks ago. And uh, Nigeria has set a record uh, during the Ebola crisis when the country uh, stood up and fought the spread of Ebola. Uh, so I'm quite confident that uh, Nigeria is prepared. But as uh, the Director General of uh, NAPDAC, uh, our mission is to safeguard the health of our people and uh, to ensure that the food and the drugs that they're going to get are wholesome. And from the treatment perspective, uh, this disease didn't happen four months ago. Uh, whatever is happening now in terms of treatment uh, is all trial, and it falls into clinical trial, uh, emergency uh, trial, so to say. And uh, as uh, the head of uh, NAVDAC, I started looking at what is there, what is out there that can be used. If you go on our website, about two weeks ago, we posted uh, what the World Health Organization has already in terms of investigations or research that are going on uh, for vaccines, for drugs, for diagnostic kits. Uh, but in terms of uh, drugs, uh, there are several drugs that have been, that have been looked into, uh, it's just all research. Uh, but uh, about a week ago, I saw that there, there is a clinical trial uh, that has taken place in China uh, for 100 patients, over 10 hospitals, and in six cities. And I saw that it is chloroquine that they used for these 100 patients. The report said that chloroquine has a superior efficacy uh, compared to the control. Uh, and I just you know, said, well, chloroquine is an old drug that all of us took one time or the other in Africa. And uh, we started looking at how to be prepared just in case uh, there is a spread. God forbid that there's going to be a spread or somebody will get very ill. What should they take? So we are talking right now with uh, a manufacturing company uh, that uh, used to make chloroquine. You know, chloroquine was banned uh, about 10 years ago, or a little bit more than that, because the malaria parasite developed resistance against chloroquine. So now what we use for malaria treatment is combination therapy. Uh, so chloroquine was banned. So if chloroquine is now being reported as uh, if somewhat effective, and we've already banned it as, a, as an agency or as a regulatory agency, uh, we have to start thinking uh, quickly. And that is what we've been doing in NAVDAC, uh, talking to a company that may be able to make uh, chloroquine uh, tablets uh, that can be used just in case. This will just be for emergency stock. And uh, our people should be very, very careful in terms of rushing to get chloroquine, <laughs> to get chloroquine to use, no. Unless you are diagnosed, unless the doctor prescribes, please don't uh, use chloroquine because it also has side effects. It is just that, you know, uh, it is a drug, it's an old drug uh, for, anti uh, for, for treatment of malaria. Uh, so we are already used to it. So that's part of what we are doing as an agency. Well, uh, Professor Adi, uh, let me come back uh, uh, to you. Recently, uh, we were told that uh, Professor Maurice Yu of uh, uh, Bow Resources Institute has been able with his team to isolate a particular compound uh, that may help, you know, uh, to uh, solve the uh, challenge of uh, coronavirus. But this morning, the papers are reporting that after uh, Professor Yu contacted the Ministry of Health and the uh, Ministry of Science and Technology, uh, that isolated comp compound has now been sent to the United States uh, for testing, assessment, and all of that. Is it that NAVDAC 
uh, which is the uh, agency, the relevant agency in Nigeria, does not have the capacity uh, to uh, uh, do such a thing, to provide such tests. And if, 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 if not, uh, are you in any way, as an agency, involved uh, with the uh, 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 isolated compound come up, uh, uh, brought up by uh, Professor Iwo? Thank you for that uh, uh, comment about the uh, medicine that uh, Professor Iwo uh, reported. Uh, I'm not aware of that particular uh, uh, compound or molecule, uh, but uh, in terms of uh, sending it out uh, to be tested in the US or any other country, Nigeria has the capacity. Nigeria has the capacity to test it. Uh, you need to get the isolate of this uh, uh, virus to test against uh, different uh, agents that have been reported to work. Uh, uh, but NAVDAC, as a, a regulatory agency, will need to get a clinical trial protocol uh, from whoever has such a uh, medicine or compound uh, because we have to review uh, the clinical trial protocol. That we have. But uh, as of this morning, I've not seen any clinical trial uh, protocol uh, or even a publication. I just mentioned that I read a publication about clinical trial using chloroquine. Uh, I wish that there is uh, a publication uh, about this medicine uh, that is there that we can also fall back on. Thank you, Professor. And Dr. Peters, I'm going to come back to you now, Dr. Peters, to get your to get your opinion on something to do with this as well. Because I mean, most of our manufacturing or raw materials or imports come from China, and this puts us in a very problematic position with an issue like coronavirus because we need to start looking inwards. We need to start looking at using our own raw materials to manufacture medication, etc. What efforts are currently being made in this regard to sort of curtail Nigeria's dependency on China for manufactured drugs or raw materials to manufacture drugs? And how is the WHO, if in any way at all, also helping Nigeria in this regard? Right, thank you. I think the most important thing is to know that this is a new virus, and a new virus with many unknowns. And therefore, with many unknowns, there are many actions uh, uh, globally in uh, looking at the treatment option and the vaccines option. Many countries uh, have started this journey in terms of uh, getting vaccines and the treatment. They're all, as Professor said, the clinical trials. And normally, uh, if we want to get a vaccine, we want to get a, a treatment approved, it goes through a process. The process is quite tedious. But in emergencies, it is a bit, uh, can be shortened. But again, we need to be cautious that uh, when we apply these uh, this, uh, drugs, they will not have side effects on the patients because the issue of ethical uh, uh, practice is very important. So WHO is coordinating this at the global level. And if uh, we need to ensure the quality, we need to ensure that uh, uh, um, the safeguards are there, it might be good to start maybe uh, with a few, uh, few countries with the good capacities uh, so that those uh, vaccines or the drugs can be easily made available. What WHO has made it globally very clear is that this is a time we need ourselves as a global community. The fact that some countries have capacity to produce as quickly as possible uh, the drugs or the vaccines, they should not look at themselves as that country. They should look at the global. So the projection includes the global uh, uh, demand. And therefore, a country like Nigeria, while the initiatives in the country, uh, there's some capacity through the NAFDAQ in the country, but also that is an added uh, um, advantage if we get uh, these vaccines quickly. So there's a lot of work going on uh, to get the vaccines and, uh, and um, uh, treatment as quickly as possible. Dr. Peter, let me uh, uh, still come back to you. I mean, uh, WHO has uh, expressed concern about the shortage of medical supplies, particularly with regard to protective uh, uh, medical equipment and also sanitizers, face masks. I mean, there was a report that in, uh, in France, uh, 
face marks were stolen from a particular hospital, running into, into thousands. But does WHO, does it have a strategy in place for engaging uh, these uh, uh, manufacturing companies to ensure that uh, medical supplies, you know, uh, improve in the face of coronavirus, beyond just advising that uh, these companies should increase production by about 40 percent? Right. Um, uh, definitely, you are correct that uh, there is a global shortage, but I think this is being addressed. WHO is working with the uh, companies globally to ensure that we have supplies. If I can speak for Nigeria specifically, at the moment we are receiving a lot of supplies from the country to ensure that the country has protective equipment uh, to be able to protect the health workers, but also the patients who are being kept in isolation facilities. They are protected according to the standards. Here, in a face of a global uh, public health threats, sometimes we are driven by panic and fear, and uh, sometimes we take uh, decisions which are not uh, scientifically correct. Um, for example, um, the demand for masks, you see people wearing masks, are these ordinary masks, those are not really encouraged, people should be wearing them. The masks that are recommended for people if you are really sick are the specialized masks. And these are put properly, not the way we use ordinary masks. So in the face of a, a public health threat like this, we need to be guided by facts and we need to avoid fear and panic. The same with the sanitizers. Now, simple and basic uh, preventive measures, which WHO has, which everyone should have, washing hands is cheapest that anybody can do uh, in their house, everywhere you can do it. Uh, ensuring that we have respiratory etiquette when we cough, when we sneeze, which everybody can do and is easier. So sometimes we sanitize us if it's available, that is good, it's beautiful. But sometimes not everyone can have them, uh, even take the whole country. So let's employ all the basic uh, means of prevention um, uh, in the communities and in the country. Thank you for that, Dr. Peter. And Professor Ade, I'll come back to you now. And I want to revert to an interview that we had yesterday with the president of the Pharmaceutical Society of Nigeria. I posed a question to him with regards to the federal government's response to pharmacies increasing prices on surgical masks, hand sanitizers, and other sorts of prote uh, uh, protective gears that people are trying to get ahead of coronavirus. And he said that it is something he completely doesn't agree with, and we should allow market forces to run. And the federal government should not have taken that step. I'd like to get your response to how, because I, I, I guess he does represent the view of pharmacies across Nigeria as the president of the, Pharmaceutical Society, um, of the Pharmaceutical Society of Nigeria. So I'd like to get your view on his response to that and how much effort is also being put in in terms of research and development for us to start manufacturing our own drugs to end dependency in other parts of the world. I understand the notion of having a global outlook and being able to depend on other countries if need be, but we do also need to look in in terms of research and development. How, how much effort is being made in this regard? What is happening right now uh, this coronavirus crisis, it sh it's an eye-opener, or it should be an eye-opener for African countries. We have drug or medical product insecurity. 70% uh, of our drugs or drug products are imported from China or India. Our manufacturers are feeling it right now in terms of getting raw materials to make their products in the country. Uh, I'm meeting with the manufacturers on Monday to discuss the next steps. A country that has drug insecurity is an unsafe country at the height of HIV AIDS. About 30 million Africans died because there were no drugs for them. We don't manufacture anything relating to pharmaceuticals. The only thing we have in Nigeria is water. We import everything 
We need to wake up. We need to wake up as government. We need to wake up as private citizens and know that if we don't have drugs, especially in cases like this, we are all prone to danger. I've been talking about drug insecurity for a while now. We are encouraging manufacturers to manufacture locally. We have a policy that is called 5 plus 5 uh, validity policy in NAVDAC that was instituted last year or about 18 months ago. That if you've been bringing your medicines into the country, importing for years, it's time you start manufacturing locally. Because our local manufacturers are really suffering. And I mean economically suffering. Because if you have to import everything, you can just imagine what the bottom line is going to be. That is one policy. We are also strengthening our manufacturing sector so that uh, big pharma, big pharmaceutical companies uh, outside Nigeria can partner with them. We did a lot of uh, good manufacturing practice inspections, which are still ongoing as follow-up to ensure that our manufacturing companies know what they are supposed to do and they are responding beautifully. That is why we now have two, one of, two of the most, of the biggest rather, companies in the world partnering with two local companies in Nigeria. But that is something that is going to start yielding uh, uh, fruits in the near future. But this is a wake up call for all African countries. We cannot manufacture even aspirin as active pharmaceutical ingredients in the country. That was the first thing I manufactured as, or I was taught to manufacture as a student at Nsuka. We cannot. We have, le we have left our priorities and, and focus on things that are not of priority in this country. So this is a wake up call. Our government should support our local manufacturers' incentives. If we don't manufacture anything, please let's get the incentives such that the local manufacturers can start producing. Uh, again, uh, for this uh, coronavirus, I pray and hope that there is no spread. But if there is spread, we are already making plans to have a stock of a cheap medicine, chloroquine, so that just in case, there are two or three other drugs that are being looked at right now, but those are not really easily affordable for low middle income countries. So NAVDAC is uh, on alert and we are working uh, very, very closely with manufacturers. Thank you. Well, Prof, I, I, I think just by way of clarification, when you say that um, local manufacturers don't manufacture drugs except uh, water, uh, yeah, just yesterday we had the uh, president of the Pharmaceutical Society of Nigeria on this program, Mr. Samo Hambuma. And he was talking about research and development and, you know, what some of the pharmaceutical uh, companies in Nigeria do, particularly Nimeth, uh, where he's a member of the board. Uh, could you clarify this? So what exactly are these uh, pharmaceutical companies in Nigeria doing? Do they just import drugs and, uh, you know, do not uh, really produce any drugs? I just let me clarify what I just said. Uh, our local manufacturers manufacture finished drug products, meaning they manufacture aspirin, tablets, uh, paracetamol, uh, so many drugs. But we import 70% of finished products. Finished products meaning tablets of suspension, emotion that you can take it. We only manufacture locally 30%. But in terms of raw materials, because for a tablet, you have, you, you have an active ingredient, which we call API, you may have five or six non-active ingredients that will enable that uh, drug to be manufactured. What I said is that we don't make any of the raw materials in Nigeria. We import everything, raw materials. 
But even for finished products, we import 70%. And our companies are, have capacity. Our companies in Nigeria are operating at 35% capacity. Meaning those ones that are even manufacturing the 30% of the drug products that we need. That is why we're encouraging local manufacturing. And African Free Trade Agreement is coming very soon. This is the time to come alongside the local manufacturers so that we will not become a dumping ground. NAVDAC will not allow that anyhow. But if you have 100, 100 uh, companies trying to register products and you cannot export any product, you can now see uh, the imbalance. So we need the support of the government. The pharmaceutical companies need the support of the government because of insecurity that we are in right now in terms of drug supplies. Thank you, Professor, for that clarification. And certainly we do need to look towards helping our local manufacturers to maximize their potential. It's the only way that we can see any sort of sustainable developments in that particular industry. And Dr. Peter, I'm going to come back to you, and I'd like to actually re-ask a question that I had posed earlier to Professor Adeya with regards to the federal government uh, saying that they are going to sanction any pharmacy that is seen to be increasing prices of surgical masks or hand sanitizers during this period of time. Where does the WHO stand on that? And the second leg of the question I will bring towards you is with regards to drug insecurity in Nigeria, also having another dynamic of fake and synthetic drugs being prevalent across the country. How much effort is the WHO making and what organizations, except for NAFDAQ, are the WHO also working with to ensure that Nigeria is, well, winning against this crisis when it does come to battling um, fake and synthetic drugs on the market? Uh, thank you very much. One thing that uh, uh, we all know in any country, the constitution of the country says the government should protect its people. That includes health. In situations of public health threats, you have disease outbreaks. These are situations not for exploitation. What is very clear, uh, WHO has and discussed with the governments that agreed it is universal access to health services. And this includes also in times of disease outbreaks. When the country is challenged with uh, uh, public health threats, we need to ensure that everyone, every life in the country is very precious and that is treated with the care for everyone. And therefore, in situations like this, I mentioned earlier that we need our own solidarity, even within the country. The government cannot do it alone. It requires the government, the private sectors, the partners, and the community, the individuals themselves. It, are, it is our collective responsibility. And therefore, the government sets out uh, what is best for its own people, which WHO normally does not. What WHO advises is that services should be available to the people. When the people need them, they should, get, they should have them. There should be no barrier financially to accessing services, especially protective uh, uh, services, because this is where you can stop. It's cheaper to prevent than to treat. And for countries in Africa where our systems, health systems are weak, uh, prevention plays a bigger role. And in fact, a lot of problems in Africa can be prevented if we all work together. So in this scenario where we have these uh, outbreaks, what is important is that uh, one, as uh, the government, as a private sector, how do we ensure the health security of own people? Because a disease in any person is a disease that can affect me. In any part of Nigeria today, if one segment of our society is not well protected, they get infected, it will reach everyone. There is no way no segregation about it. And therefore, in terms of uh, our, our own obligations as a, a citizens, but also the private sector, let's support the government. I know that there is a demand for supplies. Those supplies, we should maintain the quality uh, that they are kept. We don't have to rush with the quality. We should not compromise with the quality. That the price are also affordable for people to get them. 
And therefore, WHO does not go into those great needy in terms of uh, dictating to the government. But what is fundamental and crystal clear for all the governments is that last, let there be no financial barriers to services for the people. The people should access them. If it are protective equipment, they should be able to access them, especially if it are manufactured locally. And even if it are manufactured outside the country, uh, um, partners, including WHO, should be able to bring this to the government and at no cost, so that everyone is protected. Well, Dr. Peter, uh, recently the uh, Director General of WHO, uh, uh, Dr. Gabriel Jesus, uh, described the coronavirus as an international health emergency of uh, concern. Now, at what point uh, will it become a pandemic, a global pandemic? Particularly now that, you know, about 80 countries have been affected and, you know, so many uh, deaths across uh, uh, virtually every uh, continent. All right. Um, normal the stages of declaring uh, um, public health emergence of international concern or pandemic is guided by uh, the, the, the expert committee, advice from the expert committee. The fact that uh, many countries have reported the cases, this is being weighed by the expert committees globally um, and cautiously uh, advising the director general of WHO on what steps to take. And I do believe that when uh, the level was elevated uh, to public health emergency of international concern, it was clearly indicated that this could be reviewed in a three months' time or could be reviewed any time before the three months, depending on the situation. And I, I believe that uh, um, the expert committee are guiding the WHO uh, Director General on the next steps, if it indeed constitutes uh, a pandemic, or oh, it is not. What is very clear in the last, from last week, the global assessment is very high. The threat is very high. That is globally. And it means that uh, we need uh, to scale up um, the preparedness efforts for countries that are not in uh, this situation. For countries like Nigeria, where we would have a case, it is a mix of the two, uh, preparedness, but also contained the outbreak quickly. And I think that is what is very important for every country to stop the transmission. That is the most important fundamental thing. So whether uh, the next step will be elevated will be guided by the advice from the expert committee globally. Thank you, Doctor. And Professor Ade, I'd like to come back to you now. And this is now with regards to the National Assembly uh, due to the outbreak of COVID-19, of course, coming out to say that they would go on a two-week plenary um, for their own safety. Now, the Director General of the NCDC came out to speak on this, describing it really as out of place, saying that, of course, that's just going to cause panic in society if we're not shutting down schools, if we're not telling people not to go to work, then why should our senators or our lawmakers uh, go on a two-week plenary? What is your take on that response from the National Assembly? Uh, we just listened to uh, Dr. Clement in terms of uh, the WHO reaction to this uh, crisis. And uh, the word fear was also used by him uh, that we should be very cautious about uh, uh, letting fear or panic grip us. Uh, in terms of the National Assembly, I've not really, I've been very busy. Uh, I don't know what led to uh, their decision or their proposal or whatever to go on break uh, because of uh, COVID-19. Uh, but uh, all of us, just like uh, WHO just said, uh, we have to come together at this point and work together and make sure that this uh, spread is, uh, excuse me, this uh, disease is contained uh, and to make sure that, you know, we use all the preventive uh, actions possible uh, that we can use personally to prevent transmission. Uh, NAVDAC uh, works 24-7 uh, and uh, we've been doing that since the beginning of this crisis or we have actually heightened up our own uh, activities 
uh, just to make sure that we are prepared, just in case. I hope it doesn't get to that point, but we have to be prepared. That's the uh, spirit. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Peter. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Adeye.